welcome to part two of <laughs> Lambada versus the Forbidden Dance. So again, I have Dr. Mills Moyes joining me for us to analyze the second film, which is named The Forbidden Dance. Ooh. And as we said in the previous video, it was released on the same day as Lambada, which was March the 16th of 1990. The cast comprises Laura Haring, who plays the role of Nisa. I know her from, have you, are you familiar with the film Mulholland Drive? It's by David Lynch. It's, con, it's widely considered one of the greatest movies ever made. It's very abstract and modernist and profoundly strange. And she stars in it. Because when I saw Nisa, I'm like, she reminds me of someone. When I Google her, I was like, wow. she, she plays, I think, twin characters in Mulholland Drive. Um, Rita and Camilla Rhodes or something like that. And it's, she has a really prominent role in that movie. Mulholland Drive is this weird, interesting film. It kind of is shot like a TV movie okay. in terms of the aesthetics and maybe even the types of cameras that they use. But it's it's a really, really important movie. People either love it or hate it. If you know anything about David Lynch, he's profoundly strange. So it's interesting to see her in this early role. In a, in a movie like this that was widely panned and yeah. very mainstream, when she's associated with one of the most art house, strangest movies ever made. That's Hollywood for you, baby. We have Jason, who is played by Jeff James. And then we have Sid Haig, who's playing the role of Joa. I think that's like enough of the main cast. Oh, oh, you, how you, you left out two of my favorite... Who? You left out two of my favorite characters and actors. <laughs> so Richard Lynch, who plays Benjamin Maxwell, the kind of company thug. We well, can get into his character later, but I have a long long history with that dude in movies so we could get into really yeah he's a really important figure in my movie growing life and i'll we'll, we'll get into that and then barbara brighton who plays ashley i yeah. mean ashley was a great character <laughs> and it was directed by graydon clark who is actually the cousin of the guy who directed la mbada yeah, I remember you said that last time. Some family rivalry going on there. And I'm sure you probably did some reading as to how the film was developed. It would explain the quality of the film, but we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to start things off, we know that the first scene, which is setting the stage, as one might say, we see that the film is being filmed in the Amazon. And there's a text on the screen that reads, Brazil, the Amazon. Mankind is destroying the rainforest. So we know that we're watching a socially conscious film. We can Support see that. Yes. Is it actually socially conscious? Well, we'll see. So then after that scene, we get right into the jungle and we hear this song, Capoeira, is sung in Brazilian Portuguese. And we see the images of the people and the local tribe and they're singing their own songs. And afterwards we get this image which I can see is very ethereal, but a bit sexy of the lead, Nisa. And she's drinking from a coconut. Very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like this very ritualistic ceremony going on. So we're getting this idea of what's the culture, what's the tribe up to? What do you think about this opening scene? Yeah, this they're trying to root it into some indigeneity and tribal stuff and showing how they're connected with with nature so that opening script is telling us about the issue right mm -hmm. the rainforest and then you're seeing the people who are being most impacted by this um but right away and i know this is something you probably want to talk about too i was very struck by the sort of racial coding of the group and the, and the costuming because Nisa is dressed in white. The other tribes people are dressed in a more brown color. She already stands out because she's much more light-skinned than the others. Yeah. And that is accentuated by the fact that she's in white again. I think her and her dad has a sort of white garment, but even his white garment has some accessories, accoutrement, if you will, um, that, that kind of accentuate is different, but she is so pristine, like she's, she's more light-skinned and just beautiful and innocent. Like all of those things are being coded in the way that her costuming is presented. Yeah, which brings us to a scene. So there's like the whole ritual thing going on and then her father presents this fruit to her and he says it's the first fruit of the harvest season. 
in their language, which I still wasn't really clear about before I even dive into her and the way like she's dressed and presented. Because the language part, they're speaking Portuguese, but it sounds very Spanish-like. And then when I did some research on her, I was just like, oh, she has Mexican heritage. So this is yes. what Portuguese was sounding more Spanish-like. I, I'm a little familiar with Portuguese. Yeah. Brazilian Portuguese, especially. Yeah. And I was like, why are they speaking Spanish in this? While this is happening, she's having the first word because I guess since she's a tribal king's daughter. She's a princess, basically. I don't know what Ashley has to say about that, but that's for another thing. And <laughs> we have a gun go off and then we have Benjamin Maxwell, Mill's favorite character who comes in and he's representing the Petramco Corporation. So he's telling them that the company now owns the land. But then he's trying to like speak to them and nobody's understanding the language of the white man. And Mills, I think this is where you can take control again of this conversation. <laughs> oh, is it because I'm a man? Do I have to take control of the conversation? <laughs> oh my yeah, so th- th- that's some deep post-colonial stuff starts to mm-hmm. enter the narrative. But again, we won't have great, as many great lines as last week. But <laughs> that's true. You have one or two yeah. wonderful lines here, and I, I made sure I wrote it down. When he, when he comes in, um, my my quote unquote favorite character, he says, "It's a shame to clear this jungle. It's so pretty, but business is business, you know." <laughs> and I should, before we, we get into it, I should clarify what we were talking, what I was talking about when I said I have a long history with him. So yes, Richard Lynch as an actor. In the 80s or 90s, if there was a sinister bad guy in a movie, mm. it was him. Like, he he made a career. He was, talk about typecast, of being sinister mm. bad guys in movies and shows. Once I saw him, I was like, oh, my guy, the quintessential bad guy. But there's one particular feature that kind of confined him to that. And you know what it is? What is it? He has a scar on his face. He has noticeable scars. Honestly? Before you even get into that, the quality of the film, it was like so bad. There was no yeah. way I was going to know that he had a scar on his face. I'm sorry. Yeah. When he was young, I think around 16, mm. he almost burned to death or something. Oh, wow. So he has these scars on his face that quote unquote make him look sinister and Hollywood typecast him because of his scars for the, his entire career. He made the best of it. He made a lot of money, but I, I wish I could have heard some, maybe read some interviews on how he felt about it. But anyway, when you see him show up in a movie, you're like, oh, this it's it's about to go down. And then he has a he has a, a cowboy hat, just in case. Yeah, like so American. <laughs> <laughs> With the American imperialist sort of, we talked about costuming. So even his costuming there was very telling. Um, so he enters this, this space. And of course, Brazil is a post-colonial space because of the Portuguese and them. Yeah. Now we have the neo-colonial entrance there because of the, the, the American who has come to cut down the rainforest and take, and take control. And, you know, it's business. It's not personal. But the thing that made me laugh, he's saying like they have to leave the forest because he's going to burn everything down. And she says, stop. And then he's like, oh, English. And then Nisa continues father sent me to the missionaries to learn about the white man conveniently for the sake for the plot of the movie this is very pocahontas quoted mm-hmm, you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying like the whole john smith narrative well i mean it goes even more into that later on but just at the beginnings the white man comes and it's like oh you know how to speak to them because like father had the foresight to have me associate with these people and to give me even more privilege when it comes to being the daughter of the chief. I'm not sure if you ever saw the film um, The Sleeping Dictionary with Jessica Alba. I haven't seen that one. I can't remember exactly where it was located, but there were missionaries that came to whichever country she's in or island, and she's lighter skinned than everybody else. And in their custom, in order to help the white man learn their language, they sleep with him. So that's why she's like the sleeping dictionary. So they sleep in bed with him. You know, they start playing house more or less. And when I was watching this film, like that was just something that kept on coming back to my mind. So everybody runs out of where they are right now in the forest. And Nisa says she has to go save her people. We see a plane (laughs) flying over. So we know somebody got on a plane. And all of a sudden this 
princess finds herself in Los Angeles. Um, Similarly to our last movie, we're back in LA. <laughs> Hollywood to be precise. And it's just very bizarre for me because I was just like, the paperwork. How did they sort out the paperwork? She's a princess. Come on. Let's stamp that visa fast. That's the thing I don't understand. It's like when it comes to immigration and these films, it's just so nonsensical, especially as both of us know about immigration. And immigration. <laughs> Personally, yeah. You especially in the U.S. So we find a princess who automatically knows where the headquarters <laughs> of Petramco is. And she's there with her witch doctor, who doesn't have a name as yet. Like nobody says his name, which yeah. is something I found interesting. Another thing that I found interesting is the fact that this man is actually of Armenian descent and he's playing this indigenous character or Native American character, whichever word that you prefer. It was just very weird <laughs> for me, like when I found that out, because I was just saying like I had seen this man in a lot of movies growing up. The same thing with you and Maxwell. It's like, this is somebody I had seen his face over yeah. and over. So I was like, what are his origins? And then I was like, oh, he had been like typecast as always being like a native interesting that all indigenous like character throughout his career so they enter the corporate headquarters and we automatically see like the security guard trying to speak to him and she goes he doesn't speak your language you know it's not prob- like probably the most problematic thing in the film but it just yeah. made me laugh because it was just so her acting is just so cringeworthy so you talking about her being in this david lynch film it's something is not adding up yeah, the math isn't nothing, as the kids say. <laughs> Probably, like, the script she was given wasn't the best. If, if you ever see Mulholland Drive, you'll know what I mean. Like, David Lynch is so weird. He will take people that are not very classically trained actors and make them do melodramatic, really strange things. Mm. Like, I remember her being good in it, but the movie is shot like a soap. It looks like a soap. It's very melodramatic. Yeah. It's a profoundly weird movie. So maybe that type of affect you're talking about works well. He can make, he has great actors in his stuff, but he also has people who are not known as great actors in his stuff, but he, he wants a certain affect from them and he gets it. So I'm guessing that's why she was cast. In yeah. Because he saw the forbidden dance and he was like, I need her in my movie. <laughs> and she has some very sexy scenes in Mulholland Drive. I will just, and I'll leave it at that. And she's a little older as well. So she's kind of, in this one, she's a little willowy in Mulholland Drive. She's very different. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we have this security guard who calls the tribal man Bigfoot. I don't think I need to (laughs) explain why this is problematic. This is when Joa, well, we don't know his name at the time. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But at the time he starts taking out his feathers and mystical gems. And we're like, what's going on? He is creating like a diversion to help Nisa get Mm -hmm. to the real reason that they're there at the corporate headquarters we can acknowledge a sort of knowingness in the movie for the racial kind of a this kind of a racial slur probably by the the whole bigfoot reference Mm -hmm. right saying the movie is showing that these people are racist so okay that's some knowingness there yeah but but the other part where you know, the mystical indigenous person stuff. It's a bit heavy handed. Like you said, we don't even really know this person. So he's been really sort of, he has a very narrow sort of characterization. Whereas Nisa, immediately we see Nisa as being a much more well-rounded character, which in movies, you have to make decisions about these things, yeah. right? Because not everyone is going to be a round character. At the same time, I think his character suffers a little bit from not being fleshed out a little more, especially for how much he's in the movie. So that 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 sort of falling prey to the, the mystical Native American stuff is a bit cringeworthy to me. Uh, but the movie needs a distraction and a diversion so she can sneak into a sneak upstairs and, and do some detectives, some detective work. So he's the one that gets foisted with that job i think it's very important what you're saying because it is problematic and as we said at the beginning even though we were joking around the movie takes on this theme idea i'm not really sure but of presenting itself as being um you know there for like social justice or presenting like social issues yet still they're doing a lot of problematic things throughout the film yeah. When it comes to the actual Native American or Indigenous people's like representation. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's yeah. where 
Because I like to see, if you're going to be evil, like Maxwell, I want to see you be evil in the film. I want you to say the words that somebody who is problematic would use. Well, yeah, exactly. In a framework, obviously, you know, but I want you to act out and show me how evil you are. If you want to be a villain, show me you're a villain, like not holding it back. So like, that's what I was happy about. Then when it came to the actual people, the native people, indigenous people that were supposed to be represented and be protected because it's their story, quote unquote, that's being shared with the world. I yeah. did like some of the choices that were made and we'll call them choices. <laughs> Hopefully they were choices. <laughs> When she's um, trying to sneak up the stairs, that's when we have Maxwell who comes face to face with her and he remembers her from the Amazon. Oh, how, how would you not remember Nisa? And then they have a conversation. Joa continues his distraction and like they take him away and Nisa is left to like run away and, you know, like fend for herself. And then in the next scene we see at the water fountain where she, she meets <laughs> one of the best characters in the movie so she meets Carmen the maid we don't know her name at the time but she just meets Carmen at the water fountain she asks her first of all like do you have papers hilarious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a number of reasons we'll see again and Nisa is like no Joa has them I think it's important to know that Carmen is also indigenous just in case it's not obvious she immediately identifies with Lisa and then Carmen tells her what you need is money and she's like I'll find you a job I'm like immigration is just this thing that we call on when we need to add to the plot line but then we act like we live in a world where papers immigration documents don't exist the next scene Carmen finds her job right away and she's at this rich white woman's house for me it was very weird for her to say I'm happy to work and then automatically the job that we see her as is like a maid now yeah. again this is a reality for a lot of Latin people in the U.S. there's nothing yeah. wrong with it but there was just something about the saying I'm happy to work finding her a job as a maid at this rich white family's house and it was just like a little bit too on the nose for me so that's why they said i'm saying like there are choices that were made and some of them are problematic in trying to represent this story of these indigenous peoples but then you can understand why in the late 80s, early 90s, like this was the choice that was made. Having her be a maid, there's just so many stories mm -hmm. where, for one, these people are presented in servile positions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a way you can read it. I don't think the movie is smart enough <laughs> to have been <laughs> attempting this. But there's also a way in which you can read it. This is a literal princess. This is someone who is within the context of a society, well-educated, you know, comes from privilege, but when she enters the American space, that's the only thing she can get. And there are so, I know people, I remember a, a really good friend of mine, she was a Peace Corps volunteer in St. Lucia. Her family mm -hmm. is from Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And when they fled Cambodia during Myanmar, now Myanmar, obviously, when they fled that place, her father was a doctor there. When mm -hmm. he got to the US, they didn't recognize his degrees. He had to sell yeah. pizzas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he sold pizzas to make a living to, to take care of his of his children until they finally recognized his qualifications and now she's a doctor is the movie making that commentary yeah. it would be very generous of me to yeah. to read that into it but there's a way in which you can do something like this to show how the american space diminishes people and, and doesn't see people in a holistic way people who come from yeah. all different backgrounds and have all different types of skills they just well, this is how you are because you're a brown person or an Asian person. This is what you can do for me. You can work in a civil position. And then there's just like this aspect of, as you were talking about, like immigration and white supremacy, which is just very much encapsulated in that scene for me, especially when yeah. the mom goes, oh, like our last maid was from Mexico. And then she's like, I'm from Brazil. As a Caribbean person who's not Jamaican, like I just reacted to that. And I'm sure a lot of Latin people react to it when people just, I'm like, no, I'm from Ecuador. I'm from Guatemala. I'm from Brazil. Like I'm not Mexican, please. Don't, don't, 
People exactly. are very defensive and understandably so. Again, probably there's some social commentary going on with yeah. the choices that were made. But again, it's just hilarious. And she's like, I'm from Brazil. And then the lady goes on to say, oh, we were there last summer or whatever. I don't, I can't remember what she said. Or last winter. The way she's saying it's so innocent. But we all know what's going on in the background. So that was funny. Again, when it comes to immigration and the lack of immigration processes in these films acknowledging the struggle... How is this rich white woman hiring a maid with no paperwork? Oh, and her husband is a lawyer. I mean, you ask this still, ha- but this still happens. How many solutions went up to New York and work as maids and stuff at, at these people's homes without papers? Like, there are gener- there's generations of solutions who were raised on this. But in the later scene, the lady's like, she just came in with her bag. Just hiring the first young. You're saying she should, you're saying she should be a little bit more careful. Yeah. Maybe she should have gotten some references, ask her for her references or something. At least three. But then probably for her, it was like, oh, she speaks English pretty well. So let's just hire her. Yeah. You know, even talking about the English comment, what did you think of her accent? It was a little bit weird. I, I mean, again, I have been close to Brazilians. So I know what Brazilians sound like speaking English, the Brazilian accent. And that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> It definitely was not it. Uh, but again, it's one of these things where the the majority of people watching this movie aren't going to be able to differentiate or know, so they don't care. This is the time when the lady is giving her a house tour. She meets unknowingly her love interest throughout the film because he's sleeping in bed. Wonderful life. Love it. While other people are getting work, he's trying to get some hustle on he's sleeping exactly and then it's a party the night away. Find out why he's sleeping that's even more hilarious anyways so from that scene we bounce to the jail cell where we see them mystical witch doctor meditating isn't there something else that happens in there well what i remember from that scene is he's meditating on the floor with his food that they serve to him in the jail cell and then this man is trying to sneak to take an apple off his plate. And then he opens his eyes and just gives him the entire plate. Yes, it is. So it was like very, very Marxist, as you would say. You don't need to steal. We will feed you. We're in this together. And then we get back to the house now with the rich family. And we see Nisa, sexy. I have thoughts. Dancing and touching herself. I got, I got thoughts. Have, with her necklace and the capoeira song from the beginning, that same hot song is playing, you know, the one from the first scene when she's drinking from her coconut. First and foremost, <laughs> and I think I even wrote this down. Why yeah. is this young woman in a room by herself dancing so seductive? Like, like there's no one else there. Is that a thing people do? Like just perfect lighting, just the right amount of breathing going through, looking great, like just dancing so seductively by herself. I'm like, this is, but of, but of course, there's a matter of, in, in films, we always talk about the gaze, mm. right? And mm. some feminist scholars, particularly Laura Mulvey, one of the great feminist scholars of mm-hmm. film, wrote about the, the male gaze in film. Mm-hmm. And that's a moment that is typified by the male gaze. Jason is looking at her. She's not aware that Jason is looking at her, but she's dancing this seductive dance. But it, it, it's really about Jason's gaze looking at her. And it's just profoundly unrealistic. And it, it plays on so many stereotypes. Again, because I know Brazilians mm. and Brazilian women in general, there's a stereotype that they are incredibly sexual. Mm. Um, and that, that if Latin people in general face this, but for yeah. some reason, I think it's heightened in the context of Brazil. So it, it, it feeds into every stereotype because of, she's so sexual and sexy that she's she's dancing and putting on this dance by herself, clearly. It just so happens that the young man of the house is watching her, but it was a very, uh, just a, a profoundly strange scene to me. Let me break this down. She got hired, let's say in the morning to early afternoon because the sun is still sleeping when the morning- so you think that's the same day? Yeah, so when the mom is showing her around the house, he's still sleeping. So we're going to say it's like, you know, late afternoon, early morning. 
by the evening time you just moved into their house you're literally bent over the wardrobe under the moonlight with the candles lit in your sexy lingerie your slip mm-hmm. it was more like a slip princess princess lingerie and the son is like looking at her and all this is while the parents are discussing this woman that she just hired and again the husband who is a lawyer does not ask why is this woman in my house i guess they're just so progressive that they didn't need to have her validate her papers i mean for insurance reasons don't believe in borders i don't know if you ever look at the original borders of mexico Mm -hmm. but all of that is supposed to be mexico maybe they're like originalists or something while she's still doing her sexy dance the phone rings and she turns and she sees that Jason, again, we don't know his name at this time, but we see that Jason is staring at her lustfully. There's definitely for him, young man from a particularly staid upper class family. She's, she represents this exotic other that's different from what he's grown used to. And not only that, when she realizes that he's there watching her gazing, she just looks up and smokes. Almost like she knew he was there or something. Like she was putting on a show. And we see Jason on the phone. He's talking to somebody. We have no idea who it is at the time. And then he's like, I thought you wanted to come to dance with me. And when he hangs up the phone, he's like, oh, I guess like I'll just ask or whatever. Like, like why not? Or something like that, he says. To give us the impression that he's going to look for somebody else to dance with i wonder who that could be (laughs) and then we see them at the club and there is the poster of kid creole and the coconuts in the back which i guess you have to remember that for reasons that will become clear sooner or later yep and we learn that the person that jason says why not about is actually shockingly nisa our amazon princess and she is wearing his mom's dress. <laughs> we have this song, My Reaction to Passion, in playing in the background. The choices in these films during this time are just hilarious to me. The songs that they choose, how corny the lyrics are. Listen, that is 80s, 90s power ballad. Like, there's no, there's no subtlety. It's not going to be Claire de Lune, you know? It's... <laughs> But it just adds so much, but then it's so cringe at the same time. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Some of them were were bangers, though. Some of those songs were fun songs. Some of them were fun. Honestly, music-wise, I think I prefer this movie soundtrack a little bit more. I agree. Because And again, because I knew the Lombardo song from before, so maybe that's why. Anyways, so we see um, Jason taking her to the table to meet his friends and he introduces her as his dad's legal secretary because he doesn't want to say that that's the maid. And it's at this time that we also learn about the dance contest because his friend is asking, where is Ashley? Who will find out later on who this mysterious Ashley is? To be honest, like Ashley is one of my favorite characters. She is! She's one of mine too. <laughs> but um, I guess we're just being problematic. And then it moves on to Jason taking his princess to the dance floor and we hear the female friend saying so when did jason start dating i'm not going to repeat because i know it's a problem in the latin community like that is Mm. a really really bad one but then again i love in a film as i said like when people are problematic if you're gonna go there go there yeah on this movie people are openly saying words that maybe they may have they probably would have said back then yeah. Honest, and yeah. they will not have held back to say it. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. I appreciate that they're actually just not being mealy mouthed about it. That they're yeah. just presenting it as it would have been. We have a bit of social commentary taking place again. We see Jason and Nisa are dancing, and she doesn't like the song that is playing. And he says, like, I thought the whole world would have heard this song by now. And she responds, it's a big world. I like that retort. He retorts, not where I come from. It was a little bit of wording, but it was yeah. very impactful. I, yeah, I yeah. like that back and forth. As a, as a you know, as post-colonial quote-unquote subjects. Yeah. I like that. But it was just to show that they are very different. He just thinks of 
uh, Ellie, I guess, as being the entire world, because again, Ellie is portrayed as being a very impactful society. What's the correct word? A very important enclosed, um, <laughs> insular and LA is very insular again there were some moments where I can see where we're going with this mm-hmm. but didn't give it enough time for it to thaw out the movie was very rushed so yeah in 10 days like they made the movie in 10 days so they didn't have time to let the script mature exactly so the Lambada starts playing and she asks him to dance with her and he says it's not really my type of music it's more easterly than Beverly Hills Mm, there you go there you go and we have that like class consciousness and east ellie obviously just like we saw in our other film Mm -hmm. east ellie is like where the brown and black people are at and obviously beverly hills is where we see a little bit more like higher socioeconomic brackets they're not going to be dancing to lambada in, in in west l.a and then to keep everything sexy because that's the thread that ties both of these movies together Um, She ties up her dress and she starts dancing like seductively. And honestly, I'm sorry, but her dancing is bad. His (laughs) dancing is also bad. You have not been impressed by any of the dancing. None of it. None of it. (laughs) I feel sorry for his choreographers. I can't imagine having to put dances together for these people and have to make it look sexy and seductive. I don't even remember when I was younger watching this film. I'm like trying to figure out, did I think this was good dancing? So while he and Nisa are on the dance floor getting to know each other, she says, this will seem so far away from the world of my problems. But can we not agree that Ellie is the whole reason that her world is in shambles in her homeland? Or maybe in that moment where she's dancing and feeling the vibe from this young man, she briefly forgets her troubles and that's what the music can do melanie and so here we meet the famous ashley who comes up on the dance floor and she eyes nisa up and down and says when did they start letting your kind into the club i don't think we need to break down what this actually means (laughs) ashley came in off the top rope (laughs) in ashley's defense if you are in a relationship with a man and you called him on the phone to say, I can't come tonight, still thinking we're in a relationship, mm-hmm. he tells you, okay, you find yourself at the club and he's dancing with another woman. A you very play, attractive other woman. A very attractive other woman. And in your mind, you're still in a relationship with this person because you all have not officially broken up. There was no reason for you to think that you were breaking up. Obviously, I will come with fire. I do not understand. You should not be fighting over a man. You know, ladies saw kind of thing going on. He's not good enough for you, ladies, if he's cheating on you already. But I can understand why she would come and follow that fire straight out the bat because we didn't break up. We're still together. Yeah, I mean, you understand, like you said, that she's bringing some heat. She just just didn't have to bring the racially tinged heat. (laughs) (laughs) To give us some grace, at this point, we could have thought that she wasn't really talking about racially motivated things. At this point... Because this is our introduction to Ashley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Further okay. down the line, it becomes very clear <laughs> that yes. this is what she meant. Yes, yes, yes. But at this point in the film, if you're watching it for the very first time, but your kind there could have meant what? You might your like, kind as in poor people in poor border people. dresses, or or for lack of a better, or for I, w- I won't invoke any maybe people who steal other people, man. You know, maybe yeah. there's, you know, there's goods for that. You know, yeah, we could give her some grace there. So, but we quickly learned that this is exactly what she was referring to. <laughs> yeah. And then, so like Nisa is like, who are you? And she's like, I'm Jason's girlfriend. And Nisa is like, I'm leaving. And Jason is like, I'm leaving with you. Again, this is a weak man. This is a weak man. Because how you have a girlfriend, you haven't broken up with her officially. You are a grown man well quote unquote and you're going to you just met this other girl literally like an hour ago how, how long have they been at the club cannot be more than like these people have, have not known each other longer than two and two hours tops exactly the time he found the dress from his mom's closet and gave it to her to wear and then they drove to the club like there's something off there this man right away he's just willing to get I mean, rid of he saw her dance 
And that was it. And she hypnotized him with her hips. Her hips. Yeah, she, yeah. I mean, what what's the Shakira, right? The little, yeah. you know, South American. Well, the original is from Dirty Dancing Havana Nights with Claudia Ortiz singing. A lot of people don't know that, but I'm giving you movie history here, people. But you're putting yeah, putting us on game. So Jason is sent to leave with Nisa and not his girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> and the girlfriend calls him back. And in the process, she gets angry, realizing that he is not taking her on. And she rips Nisa's dress and then slaps Jason. Now, I'm not condoning violence. <laughs> I love the caveat. <laughs> but if there was ever a moment to slap somebody, I think that would be a good one because we're supposed to be in a committed relationship. Preparing for an audition for the Kid Creole show and you show up with this hussy in a boring dress. And he's like completely forgotten about it. He's leaving with the other woman. He's not even... And actually he's looking at... The, the actress does a fairly good job. She's, she's like, what is going on? It's like her whole world just turned upside down because as far as she know, up to the day before... She and this man had been... Not even a day before. Literally, he was on the phone with her two hours before. (laughs) Do not forget this. Uh, I mean, an Amazonian princess steps into the picture and that's it, brother. And not only that, she's dancing the forbidden dance. She's dancing the forbidden dance. Ashley Ashley is done. She has no shot. So now we're back at the parents' house. And we see that his parents are waiting up on him because they want to talk to him about his behavior. And to me, it's just very weird when I see these parents talking about their children because I'm like, you raise your children in a certain way. And when they turn out to be spoiled, Mm -hmm. why are you shocked? Why are you surprised? And while the parents are waiting up on him, we see that um, he and Nisa are walking up to the house. She's giving him the history of the Lambada talking about like how it was like so sexy <laughs> so the government Bandit. of brazil banned it and, and you like, know if the government if the government of brazil banned something <laughs> it has to be really sexy why are you the same <laughs> especially the dancing we've seen in this film whoa <laughs> exactly come on now i mean i've seen the pictures from rio carnaval exactly that's why i'm just like the films both of these films this is a critique of both of these films they're telling us that this is so sexy that it was banned but then when you see the actual dancing (laughs) by these leads in the film you're just like "Mm, okay it's one of it's one of the legacies of being from the caribbean the standard for that type of dancing being hot is so ridiculously high and then we have them cutting back to him entering to the house and he, his parents are ready to confront him about his behavior and he sends Nisa to her room and the mom is just getting angry because she's like how I, can you be with the help and then she talks about her dress so the mom realizes that Nisa was wearing her dress and Nisa is there standing in the door frame listening to the entire conversation. This is supposed to be a big house. There's too much <laughs> dropping going on here, honestly. And the mom says, her perspiration will have soaked right into the dress. Ooh. Yeah, that I'm like, wow, they're really doing this. <laughs> they're really, they're really going hard on this one. I have never, I I was shocked by that line, honestly. I have nothing to say. Do with that what you will. (laughs) Yeah. So his parents tell him they're annoyed that he's coming home late every day. And he tells his parents, now, I need your point of view on this. He tells his parents that he wants to continue dancing at the club. Because he is a good dancer. Hey, my now, brother has his calling. If that's what he's great at. I mean, you seem to be unconvinced of it, but... <laughs> but Mills, literally, when they were just at the club, like a few minutes ago, Nisa took him to the dance floor and was trying to get him to do the lambada. And she had to teach him. Like, she had to be like, hold your, what she said, like, keep your feet grounded 
and move your body like there's wind or something flowing through it. And we have like his Some female mystical. friend. Yeah. What you said? Some mystical kind of like just yeah, you know, so, yeah. feel the music, get, you know, that yeah. Yeah. And we have the female friend sitting in the booth saying something like, oh, he's such a good dancer. Yeah. Things in films and in film and TV where <laughs> you have characters, I think the technical word for it is lampshading characters in exactly. the, the text telling you what's exactly. up, you're seeing, you're like, no, I'm seeing this. Yeah, I'm seeing reality. I'm seeing what you want, but I'm, I, I'm watching it right now. I'm gaslighting me. <laughs> <laughs> So you you guys are telling me this is a great band, but it's mediocre because I'm airy. It's not mediocre. It's not good. So uh, if he couldn't it's even it's move his hips, she had to tell him like how to dance. Meanwhile, Lisa is not an expert dancer from what I have seen in the film, what I was presented with the source material. And we have him telling his parents that he is good at it. So he wants to continue dancing i.e. make a curry out of it because <laughs> that's what you do when you're a rich upper class kid you know you get involved in the arts make a so career out of the arts a few minutes ago you couldn't even move your hips <laughs> it's the mag it's the magic of the amazonian princess get with the program and now you're telling your parents that you want to continue wasting your life away dancing all night sleeping in all day okay i guess you're with the parents on this one then are, are you not <laughs> <laughs> listen i i believe in supporting your children to do what they're passionate about but you cannot dance <laughs> i didn't say i didn't say what you're good at <laughs> i said what you're passionate about. he's not even passionate about it because he really cannot even like follow basic one two step and then we see him you know, running to back to Nisa's room, I guess, to like comfort her. And we find that Nisa has run away and she leaves the sweat ridden dress behind her on the bed. <laughs> oh. Hopefully, the dry cleaning can get that sweat <laughs> on the dress. I am not going to comment on this. <laughs> and then <laughs> we cut to a scene of Nisa walking on the streets of Hollywood. And she comes into contact with um, some questionable characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was played for to show like her naivety. Like, you know, she just runs away and walks the streets of Hollywood. But I'm like, this is very pretty woman coded. <laughs> and then she walks past this club called Ecstasy. And guess what? They're hiring dancers. <laughs> I'm sure. Nisa, our innocent but not so innocent princess, enters the club. She sees this scantily dressed Madonna lookalike dancing on stage with some other like sexy looking ladies around her. Again, we're getting off from the 80s. Yeah. So Madonna is like at her peak. And there we see a black bouncer who ushers her in and introduces her to Mickey. Now, Mickey is another... Interesting character. Interesting. And that's to say the least. So she introduces her to Mickey after she says she can dance for money or like she's willing to dance for money. And Mickey tells Nisa she can dance. Like she's taking her up to... Well, upstairs. I'll just call it upstairs for now. And she take, tells Nisa she can dance for 10 bucks a night. And when we have Nisa saying, Bucks? <laughs> What's bucks? I could just I could just see the writer writing that script and putting that joke in being like gold. Now the reason I found this funny is because throughout the film we have Nisa speaking perfect English. They give her this exaggerated accent, but she is speaking perfect English, being able to communicate with a number of people, express herself fluently. Obviously, there's this aspect of naivety, but when it comes to understanding people and using their slang she is fully aware of what's going on and all of a sudden we have this joke and I as somebody who lives in a country where they're not speaking my first language um this happens to me sometimes like with basic words I'm like what's that like oh that was probably popular in the 70s or 80s and I'm like what does this mean it was just very funny I don't know like for some reason it just seemed like they really wanted to be like ha 
this will make people smile. Like, you know, this is going to be. Yeah. Or maybe because a producer, you know, a producer's note as well. It's been, it had been a few minutes. There's not been a joke in the movie and it's getting very heavy. So they're like, you know, you need to put a joke in the script here or somewhere. Exactly. That's a little bit it. No, because I'm like, there are no other places where this happens, where she's confused about like an idiomatic expression or mm -hmm, she yeah. has issues with expressing herself. And then all of a sudden it's like books, like out of all, you know what I mean? It was just, I mean, it is believable, but it still seems. Contrived. Yeah, like we were trying to make this funny. And then another problematic thing, which again, adds to showing us how a villain is a villain <laughs> what makes a villain a villain in this film um is when we have mickey who says at least you're brazilian so we know that you can dance <laughs> i feel i feel so bad for like a brazilian who doesn't dance <laughs> because the whole world is like oh, don't, don't all you people dance you know, it's it's such a stereotype. So once they get up the stairs, we realize that Nisa has found herself at not only a club named Ecstasy, but also a brothel where men can find their own ecstasy. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. <laughs> Drum roll. The reason we find this out immediately is because we can hear a man moaning and groaning in ecstasy so this man who was moaning and groaning he comes out of the door i'm like right away wow <laughs> That's a technique. fully dressed fully dressed fully dressed well he had i think he only had his trousers on probably that's true oh a trouser maybe a vest or he was bare back yeah we see this man starts like touching up nisa and she's not into it because this girl has literally just arrived and she just found out what the word bucks mean. Exactly. And now we're exposing her to this sexual... Sexually charged thing. At a brothel. And we hear Mickey telling this man, this one's special. She's fresh. And we realize that Mickey is even more questionable than we first thought. Because yeah. just like in our other film, she pulls out a blade. The signifier of shadiness in the early 1990s is the flick of that switchblade. I just don't have the words to describe the parallels. And I'm like, did they see their scripts for the they other couldn't. ones? Is it just like, what, Trisha, what's going on? Yeah. Um, Ellie at this time. At that particular time, there are just certain things that convey certain things. You know, there's certain images, there's certain objects that yeah. have feelings. And I think they're drawing from a cultural basket of these objects. And we managed to see them in relation to one another across the two films. I mean, I think that's a fair assessment, but it's just like since both of the films are literally talking about the same forbidden dance. In the same city. And with bad dancers. <laughs> Again, we get a reference to immigration. This time it makes sense because we have Mickey asking Nisa, do you have a green card? And obviously Nisa does not have any like paperwork, but that's something that we see or we think we believe that Mickey can use to her advantage. And it makes yeah. sense within this scene. The scene with the mom not asking about people, look, that's problematic for me. <laughs> but here it's like, it makes sense. Yeah, Mickey would, because people like that use these people's status against them exactly. to control and manipulate them. So it makes sense that that, that that comes up there. Especially when it comes to sex work. And sex trafficking. In short, we realize that Mickey is just a pervert because she starts talking to Nisa in this very, I think of it like as coded as when you're walking down the street as a woman and the man is like, hey, hey, pretty girl, why aren't you smiling? Smile for me. And like Mickey was talking to her in that way. She's like, you look so sexy in that dress. I was just like, ugh. She's trying to seduce her into the work. It's just so gross. Yeah. And the seduction there is more than sexual. It's, and I remember when I taught this show, Search Party, one of my students actually <laughs> wrote a really cool paper on seduction in mm. search party mm. or in seduction we always think of seduction in terms of sexual but that's just one type of seduction capitalism operates on the principles of seduction 
They make things appear mm. so beautiful and attractive. We're always we're constantly being seduced into doing things and being things that we don't want to. And Mickey is 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 operating there, trying to seduce her into that that lifestyle and initiate her in a sexual way, but also in in other ways. Now we're back at Petramco headquarters, and we see. <laughs> Maxwell, who is talking to who I believe to be the chairman of um, the company. Yeah. And he, the chairman tells him like once Maxwell exits the car, he tells him like I heard that there were some Brazilians or like indigenous people looking around the headquarters, like make sure you take care of it. You can't have indigenous people in this space. Uh, <laughs> Maxwell, again, Maxwell is this sort of higher the hand, you know, a, a fixer for lack of a better expression. That's the kind of put you hire them to get rid of any potential problems. And this potential problem is indigenous people mucking up the gums of business. And then at the second club, so this is ecstasy. We see that there is a poster of Nisa outside and Jason's yep. friends. So that's their friends from the first club. They realize that it's Nisa's face on the poster outside. When they realize that it's her, they use like a derogatory term to refer to her. And again, it makes sense. Like it's problematic, obviously. But in the film, it's like we're showing the class difference. We're showing and That's the, how people would have talked at the time. That's how they would have spoken at the time with no regard whatsoever for her as like an individual, layered, multi-layered individual. Yeah. And... So I think it was important, honestly. But are these words we should go around seeing in our everyday life? No. no. <laughs> Hell no. Yeah. So they enter the club and they see Nisa is dancing with men on the dance floor. She looks pretty uncomfortable. The camera goes to great lengths to show you how the men keep trying, you know, lowering their hands to places they shouldn't go. And she's constantly batting their hands off because she's just supposed to be dancing with them. But they obviously want more they're trying to touch her and maybe to convince her to go upstairs well one of the guys he tells the black bouncer hey brother what do you want <laughs> talk about class solidarity huh and he says like i'm not your brother i'm not your brother exactly <laughs> the movies are more of that yes <laughs> but the thing is like the acting is so bad this is something i don't think we need to say out loud it's i think people could just assume that the acting is bad so they later confirm that it's actually Nisa who is dancing. They pay the money, the 10 bucks. <laughs> A lot of money back in 1990. I know, right? And we see her struggling to get Jason's friends off of her. And again, Mickey is not even there to help. She's supposed to be the madame of this brothel. Sorry, this club, a.k.a upstairs it's a brothel <laughs> but like what kind of madame is that like she's not even protecting one of her girls and then we see like nisa fighting off the mean guy she gives him a knee to the junk area that's when mickey finally comes over and tells nisa go clean yourself up and then we see mickey going to call some of the other girls to take care of quote unquote, take care of the men. Take care yeah. of Jason's friends. But it's the two remaining ones because there was one who left, if I remember correctly. There's one who leaves when he sees things that are like going awry with Nisa. So there's yeah, a, the moral, the sort of the moral center of the of the of the boys. Moral, we'll get back to that later on. <laughs> yeah. And then we see Mickey promising them that they'll have a better time with Lisa the next time around. It's just gross. Like, Mickey is just, like, a pervert. I'm sorry. They're, like... What well, though? she's complicit. She is reproducing the structures of oppression. She is complicit, right? Look at you being a good feminist. <laughs> and my moments. <laughs> and then we're back at the jail now, but we're outside. And we can see that the cops are escorting our mystical witch doctor, Joa. They're escorting him out and one asks if he has all of his immigration papers. I'm sorry I had to note this because this was funny to me. Because it's like we use immigration when it's convenient to us in this film. Um, yes, immigration as a plot point. Yeah. As a sort of realistic thing to be grappled with. When it's convenient not to mention it at all, like you need characters to get across borders, you just yada yada it. And then when you need it for certain plot points, then you bring it up. And then we see that he roars like a lion and the cops, like they don't know where the sound is coming from. And when they go to check on it, they realize that the witch doctor has escaped. What did you think about that scene? It was giving very Hollywood 
uh, mystical energy, magical Negro, this like magical brown man who is actually Armenian, who I guess is <laughs> can be seen as racialized in American society, especially. Yeah, to, Armenians yeah. have a, a unique history and placement in the U.S. Yeah. The sound effect was interesting there, though. The sound design was cool. The raw, yeah, the way they did it and executed it, I thought it was it was pretty cool. But they're standing right next to him. And they didn't hear, and they didn't, it's almost like what he was doing, what is he projecting it? Maybe the movie is trying to tell us he was projecting it from somewhere. Just like this a movie a lot more credit than it deserves because we don't think all this went into the development of these different storylines. Let's just be honest. I'm trying to be a responsible film slash professor here. Okay, Dr. Moise. <laughs> We're back at the first club now. So the one that Jason brought Nisa to. And yeah. we see Ashley, she comes up to Jason, who is there like slumped over looking very sad because he's missing his girlfriend. New, I don't know. What, what, what is she? Who is she? He's his new love interest. Ashley apologizes for the other night. She seems sincere. What do you think? Yeah, of course. I think she's bearing her soul to him at that moment. Oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? You're exaggerating. And they talk about the audition. This is why she apologizes because she's talking about the audition for the kid creole show and she's like showing him that she wants to be back with him and jason is like i don't want you back boy has been bedazzled he's he's moved on in his heart in his head and we know we will find obviously that the the audition and the show is has other purposes within the narrative right and it's at this time that ashley reveals to jason that his friends found nisa dancing at the club and she refers to nisa as a street girl and then this one i'm sorry this is so problematic she called her a little chiquita banana girl oh <laughs> actually it's so mean it reveals something horrible about me because at that moment i never liked her more. so now we're back at the second club so Jason, like the moment he realizes that Nisa is dancing at this club, he goes into white savior mode. Mm -hmm. He goes to the second club and he sees the poster of Nisa. I'm paternal, I'm paternal male mode as well. You are right. That's true. The protector. I'm I will go, be a protector. I'm going to go rescue. I'm going to go rescue this woman. And he enters the club and there he talks to Mickey, who is our modern day madame Rafael owner and the black guy and he asks for nisa nisa comes out and he begs her to dance with him not before paying his 10 bucks though oh he gotta pay the 10 bucks exactly and so this is why when nisa comes out and he asks her to dance nisa is like did you pay <laughs> there he immediately goes into what Mills calls the paternal role and he also has like this white savior mode. She pushes back against him, which is interesting, right? Mm. Movie order, you could have played it very differently where she's like, just breaks into his arms and is like, oh, thank you, Jace. And, and, they, and they leave. But she yeah. pushes back against him a little bit. They have this like very interesting conversation on the dance floor. Why am I using interesting? <laughs> but it's not <laughs> but she asked him like why didn't he want to help before but y'all barely knew each other y'all met two days ago the entire time they probably spent together was like probably two to four hours tops <laughs> honestly when you really think about it it's but think it's movie time we're operating on the movie time so and then she's telling him like why didn't you like save me before or help me before protect me what does he know about you yeah he don't know he don't know you because it's until the end of this scene at the club where he finds out more about her. He's like, oh, like I can save you. And, and she's talking about her possible immigration issues. Again, all of a sudden immigration is an issue now where she's saying that Mickey says that I can't leave. And if I do, I don't have a green card and they will send me back to my country, but I have stuff to do here. And all of a sudden he's like, I can take care of you. I have money. I can help you for immigration issues. What money, Jason? His father can help and then maybe have a, he has a trust fund. We know Jason is not thinking that far ahead. If you're living under your parents' roof, nothing wrong with that. We're as Caribbean people, you know, we don't have any issues with you staying in your parents' house until you're financially stable. But it's like we have to work. We cannot be staying in our parents' house and doing nothing, dancing. And you cannot even well, dance. At that point, he's not concerned. He just wants to rescue the, the, the young woman he's smitten with but then they haven't built enough of a relationship in my mind 
Oh, so your team Ashley then, clearly. Yeah, because he and Ashley have established something. Both of them are yeah. problematic people for various yeah. reasons. He's trying to not be problematic anymore. No, he's still being problematic, but it's like when it comes to like the white savior mode. Mm-hmm. And then she's problematic because she's just like xenophobic and just racist. <laughs> And then we have Nisa telling him we might first and she's trying to drag him upstairs. She is trying to get him to overly sexualize or see her in the sexual way. And she's saying it in a vicious, almost tongue-in-cheek, defiant way, right? <laughs> I think the movie, obviously the movie is so is so contradictory. There's something that the movie Thank is you. trying to say, but yeah. it's, contradict- it's contradicting itself too much. He's gone into full paternal, I will rescue this innocent woman mode. And by her telling him, oh, let's go upstairs. You'll be my first. She's confronting him with her sexuality, her her agency, Mm -hmm. and sort of forcing him to see her in a way that challenges his paternalistic white savior mode because she's this innocent, this beautiful innocent woman that I have to rescue. And she's saying, oh, oh, you think I'm that innocent? I'm I'm not that innocent. Come. You yeah. can sell me right. You can sell me right now. Do like what your people really did in Latin America. If we were to really be watching a socially conscious film that's aware of itself and histories of the different peoples throughout the film, okay, but that's not going on in this film. <laughs> but I agree with you when it comes to her trying to show him that she's actually like a sexual being and Mm -hmm. she's not like this innocent person that he has projected this vision this gaze onto her Mm -hmm. trying to show him that i am a sexual erotic being and you have to respect that is it developed in a worthwhile way no because i feel like they're trying to show you from the beginning you know in the opening scene when and then also when she's dancing in the room that she is sexual and sensual mm-hmm. and um, not quote unquote pure, but he is seeing her through that lens of being my pure, innocent, people are taking advantage of you. As you said, like she's trying to show him she has agency. So she is yeah. capable of making decisions for herself and choosing what she wants to present or be in certain situations. But it's just very interesting how she's telling him come with me upstairs <laughs> and the fact that she she's saying that i made those decisions too i chose to be here too and maybe i may have been taken advantage of me but i was aware of what i was doing and i made this choice yeah that's a good point which again for a movie that's not exactly citizen kin to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to have some of that commentary in there is interesting So Mickey calls on Eddie to beat up Jason because she's seeing that they're probably trying to escape together. And Jason tries to hit first (laughs) and hit fast. But Eddie has the upper hand naturally and Mickey pulls out a knife on Nisa. How else will we know she's a terrible person? As her magical, mystical protector... He, we see Joa just appearing from nowhere. He knows exactly where she is. He enters the club and starts using his witchcraft on Eddie and Mickey in order to save Nisa and then Jason. He heals Jason because since Eddie pounced on him, we see Mickey and Eddie run out of the other two dancers that were there. And We see our favorite character, Ashley, showing up and she's listening to the conversation that follows the exit of Mickey and Eddie. And this is when Nisa starts to reveal who she truly is to her one true love. (laughs) The reveal. She explains to Jason that she's truly an Indian princess, which I found was an interesting choice of words. Mm Mm-hmm. Even in the 90s, late 80s, yes. I feel like the wood Indian would somebody from Brazil at that time use that word to describe themselves. It's a familiar word. If that was the word that she chose, she must have had some great English teachers at the missionary school because mm-hmm. that word ties her into that long history of poker. And you, you know, it's a deliberate sort of yeah. choice. She would have just said her tribe from Brazil, most likely. Yeah. And again, you're thinking of someone that's translating her experience. So did she choose Indian because she knew that was the word that he could understand? 
she is also talking about the whole reason she's there is because Petramco is killing the trees. So now we finally get back to the environmental message at the heart of this film. And I mean, Jason is like so woke. Very. Jason says he knows about the hole in the ozone layer and what's happening in the Amazon. The dude is up, he's in touch. I just found it very funny because they were making it seem like it was just like an Amazon issue, the hole in the ozone layer. Even at that time, back in the day, I think all of us knew about greenhouse gases. You know what it made me realize too, though? Jason is expanding the issue there because for Nisa and her people, they're primarily concerned about the forest, right? Yeah. And that's the context that she's come to deal with the issue on. But Jason is saying this is part of a larger environmental problem that she's not even aware of. That he, because of living in an industrialized nation and watching cable TV and all of that, he has a larger sense of the issue than she does there. Okay, Milt. Okay. <laughs> hey, look at me. I give, I give Jason some credit. Yeah, I know. Like you, you won me over with your argument. So, <laughs> and then we see Ashley fully showing herself, revealing herself in the club, and she calls out Jason for believing Nisa. Jason calls her a bigot. You <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that exact word. This made me laugh so much. I giggled honestly. I think I had to pause and giggle. He's like, you're a bigot. You don't believe her. Jason got woke in like two or three days, man. That's some good Amazonian magic they put on him. Joe and Nisa and Jason, they exit the club. And then we see Ashley waging war on poor Nisa. Now we're back at the house and we see the witch doctor outside scanning the house. What is he doing? I do not know. Is he looking for cracks in the ozone layer? More passive. He's using his powers to tap into the aura and getting the vibe. And then we see like Jason and his parents talking about what's going on. He's the one educating his parents on what's going on in the Amazon. And he's asking his dad for help. <laughs> Since his dad is a lawyer, this is when we discover his dad is actually father should a be proud of him. He's got, you know, he's taking an interest in the world. And his parents think that he's being delusional. And the witch doctor, sensing that there's some discord going on, he comes in and offers a peace offering, which he takes from his pants. <laughs> I think you need to wood this better. No, but he literally went into his pants and like pulls out something. So this is why my parents were scared. They're like, this racialized man is pulling out... A stranger, something. to be fair, a complete stranger to them. We know why the reaction was that way. I think if some random white man, they didn't know, walked into the house and proceeded to pull something out of his pants, they would freak out too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that he happens to be brown and not speak English, okay, mm -hmm. that would accentuate or even triple the anxiety there. But Well, this doesn't work. The mom just calls them barbarians. She wants them to leave the house. And Jason leaves with Nisa and Joa. And this is when we come back to Carmen's house. One of the best sequences in the movie. So those of you who are wondering, Carmen is the maid from earlier, who's the one who actually found Nisa a job at the rich couple's house, who are the parents of Jason. And obviously Carmen welcomes them with open arms and she's intrigued by Joa, this staunch stoic strong um, and they talk Carmen gives Jason a room to stay in and she says Nisa and I will stay in one room and you and Joa can go in the other room so Nisa goes to Jason's room and they start dancing the forbidden dance together oh. all while we see Carmen um, starting to dance in front of the witch doctor as he drums on the table again very exotic coded like sensual sexuality she mm -hmm. tries to speak to him in spanish but he doesn't understand well does he not understand her spanish is a different language but then at first i thought he didn't understand even though like throughout the film we know it's like a melange of spanish and portuguese. and portuguese but 
something later on makes me think he purposefully did not understand. But he was doing what we call in St. Lucian parlance, playing VCS. Exactly. But we'll get back to that soon. And then we start seeing Carmen and Joe are dancing to their own forbidden dance. And we see something that's very progressive in this film. Carmen... She holds up a condom and she tells Joel, like, do you know what this is? And then she remembers, ah, there's Nisa and Jason in the other room. And she knocks on the door and leaves a condom at the door. That was wild to me. You don't see those things in movies. It was very weird to me. I mean, it was important. Obviously, we have to, like, protect yourself, be sexually responsible. But it was just very interesting, like, the way it was done. How is she just assuming that Joel wants to sleep with her? She's thinking, how can he resist all of this? You know, in all seriousness, you know what it made me think of, though? The 1990s AIDS panic. That's why this film was even more conscious of that than a movie would be in shape. In Hollywood, there seems to be nothing less romantic than the use of a condom. The invocation of condoms in film, you hardly ever see it on TV as yeah. well. Because uh, apparently it's, it's viewed as awkward and fumbling. But the way they did it in that movie made me feel like it was a very conscious decision in response to the AIDS crisis of the 90s there. It's presented in a way that's funny, but there's a serious, there's a serious issue looking beyond the borders yeah. of the film that I feel like the filmmakers felt like they had to mention out of some sort of sense of social responsibility. I can see that, but it was just very comical. And then another funny bit was when Carmen was dancing with Joa, and then he dips her, and there's a statue of Mary behind her, and then she turns (laughs) the statue around. Carmen is a G. I love (laughs) I love Ashley, but I feel like I, I, I go back and forth between Carmen and Ashley. But Carmen is, was a fantastic character. So we see Nisa and Jason embracing each other on the bed with the sexy like 80s music playing in the background. We're not told exactly what they're doing, but you can assume. So we just move into the next scene of Carmen and Jason putting money together to purchase a plane ticket for Joa in order for him to head back to the rainforest. But... Joa does not want to go at first. So we have Carmen doing this impassioned speech about you've always been a protector and you're so stoic. Now we need you to leave Nisa B and take care of yourself, which doesn't really make sense once you... It doesn't make sense. I was like, why are they they so eager to send this man away? It was very weird. I I didn't get it. I guess if you're... If I'm trying to mount a defense, I can say, well, they're trying to say that Nisa has to do this on her own. Like it's her, it's almost like a Billings roman. It's yeah. her yeah. story of development and yeah. she has to break away from that masculine protection and do it on her own. But then you still have Jason there. Exactly. I guess you can see she and Jason are doing it together, which is different, or he represents maybe an old traditional way of doing it that will not work there. But I, it just... They just felt too in a hurry to shun this man away. And then not only that, like I felt bad for Carmen. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So it's like we have Carmen trying to speak to him in Spanish. He doesn't respond. He seems to not be able to understand what's going on. And then afterwards, we have Joa whispering to Nisa something. And once Carmen is like helping him get to the airport, like she leaves with him, wants to to help him go to the airport. We have Jason asking Nisa, what was that about? And Nisa is like, he misses the silence of the jungle. That's so rude. He just slept with this woman. He literally saw this woman naked a few hours ago. And all of a sudden he's complaining about her being like nagging or like talking too much or whatever. So that's why I'm like, does he not understand what she's saying? Or is he like pretending? Speaking of that, there was a little, a little detail I felt that was important too. That showed a sort of class consciousness. Mm. Carmen mentioned that she knows all the bus routes. Poor people take the bus. Exactly. You know, poor people don't take taxi cabs everywhere. That, that would just be way too expensive. And that's a, that's a very knowing note to have her mention the bus. So now they're back at the first club and Nisa and Jason start rehearsing. And I'm putting rehearsing in quotation marks. They start rehearsing for the audition. And the thing with the montage is that they look like they're working really hard to put a dance routine together. 
But it's really just the same dance that they have been doing from the start the beginning, yeah. of their relationship. There's no real dancing, precision, execution. Chemistry? Moves. Because they're trying to show you that there's so much effort being put into them, wanting to make sure that they win. Yeah. But when you see the dance routine, it's just yeah. bad. It's one of those movie things. It's telling you, we know that this isn't great, but for the sake of the movie, let's pretend that it is. And Maxwell shows up outside the club a few days later, thanks to Ashley. She talks about the fact that Maxwell knows her dad and he tells her, you must be a confused little girl. That was very poofy to me. Very strict. So about the fact that like, she looks like her mom, but then she was like, she acts like her dad. Because he was like, oh, you look just like your mom. And she was like, I have... Like, you know, I'm just as tough as my dad or something like, along these lines. And I was just like, what did he say? He must be a confused little girl. This is so poofy. But maybe yeah, there's some flirting. There was some awkward flirting. And during this scene, like in the car, they're conspiring against Nisa. But I'm just keep on being like, what is the real threat that Nisa poses? Mm. Because she's telling um, Maxwell that their plan is to win the competition that's bold and to go on tv and preach what he refers to as anti-american propaganda (laughs) (laughs) this movie is so serious i cannot deal you say that but even in our contemporary moment there's a way in which for a long long time the republicans often couched environmental messages or trying to put more protections for the environment as anti-american Oh, they're against industry and this is against industry and hard work. And so it's tapping into an old tradition, honestly. You present anything about the environment mm-hmm. and trying to, oh, that's socialism. That's not America. Like they, 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 they warp all of these things into a critique of the American way of life. And then we get back to the scene of them still dancing, rehearsing. And there's like the costume change montage where she tries on this dress and he's like, go change. But that's, this is Jason telling this to Nisa. Again, what is the message of this movie? Because she's scantily dressed. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a carbon girl. I don't see anything wrong with it. But literally scantily dressed throughout the film. And then we have Jason telling her, go and change her clothes. Now we're on to the next scene where it's the Kid Creole audition. So we have Ashley and Trevor auditioning and they're dancing. And the dancing is bad. Again, I don't even have to say this, but just for you listeners to know, the dancing is really bad. So why is the crowd cheering her on? And they're just cheering her on. They're not cheering on her dance partner, Trevor. They're just like, Ashley, Ashley. Uh, Yeah, that was weird, yeah. After the dance, we have Ashley in her mean-spirited, problematic girl coming up and saying, asking Jason, how is the peace score? (laughs) why i love ashley but my god what a bar that is a bar so next it's nisa and jason's turn to dance people are cheering them on i put I mean, the foregone conclusion right we know what's gonna happen i was waiting for them to show me why this dance is forbidden but as we know from the pop ghoulies from late 90s early 2000s in order to make something sexy when you don't know how to dance, you just like twirl your skirt. So there was a lot of like hair flipping going on. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh so yeah, so they did that and that gave us the impression that they were up to something. But it's clear that they're the winners, they're doing the choo-choo train, people are enthralled. So because they win with their sexy dance, we have like Jason's friends coming up to him and Nisa to apologize again in quotation marks at the end like they shake their hands I guess xenophobia and sexism and sexual misconduct are all forgiven in one yeah, yeah exactly yeah. they apologized and they kept it moving again bad writing Nisa <laughs> excuses their behavior she says I think What's his name again? What's Jason's friend name? I don't remember his friend's name. Whatever his name is, the one that was being very tansy at the ecstasy club. He apologizes and Nisa says, 
well, your pain was bigger than mine. I'm like, girl, isn't your home being destroyed? What pain does this guy have? And then another problematic thing is like the other friend, you're telling him like, aren't you going to apologize? And he responds, that wasn't me. That was my evil twin. And they laugh it off. So they leave the club and Jason gets back in the car. But before they leave the club, there's a bottle of champagne that they offer him. I guess a prize for winning the contest because he and Nisa didn't want to drink because they have the show, the live filming the next day. And once he gets back to the car, we have the valet bringing up the car and the valet knocks him over the head with a bottle of champagne that he just received. Isn't that when Maxwell takes Nisa or something like that? So... On the next scene, the next morning, we see Jason waking up in the car and he immediately drives away to a parking lot at an undisclosed location and he automatically knows that Maxwell is there. How does he know to wait for Maxwell there? I guess we're supposed to assume that they communicated. How? No idea. The continuity (laughs) issues, I'm telling you. They probably cut out the scene there. Jason and Maxwell have never interacted. Yes, Nisa knows what he looks like, but how would Jason know immediately, like when he wakes up the next morning, what happened? Because he wakes up, he doesn't see Nisa in the car. Automatically, he drives to this location. If we really had to put in context, we'd probably say the Pentramco headquarters, but so early in the morning, okay. And then he just knows, okay, this is Maxwell. I'm going to follow him. He's going to take me to Nisa. How? How does he know this? Seems so cut. And then so he follows Maxwell to the club so this is like a whole new club this is a club that maxwell has been the owner of for a few years abandoned he gives this long villain monologue (laughs) classic villain monologue so he talks about how he owns this club and before it used to be like the top club back in the day where people who were um, very successful or almost successful used to perform and he wants it to have its original glory <laughs> and in the meantime he wants Nisa to be his Vegas showgirl and do the sexy dance for him at the club that has been closed for like the past three years. I think there's some commentary there on the possessive American impulse and male ownership of of land and women's bodies and stuff like that going on there through that villainous character. There's a sense of pride, ownership. I own this formerly great space. And he's saying, you dance for me. You're going to dance and perform for me, on my whim, on my turn. There's some stuff going on there and that's emblematic of the sort of American dominance um, of space and women. That's commentary there on on the history of white men and indigenous women, like just using them for their own particular pleasure. He now has fallen, for lack of a better expression, not that he like likes her or anything, but he feels entitled to her. So he gives her this red dress to change into. As soon as she put on the dress, I was like, wow, this is where the red dress emoji comes from. You know, the dancing <laughs> woman in the red dress, yeah. And he asked her to start dancing for him. He says, I thought you liked dancing. She's like, I like dancing, but not for you. And then afterwards, they have the back and forth. And then she's like, I'm going to start dancing the lambada. She pulls her head down. And we hear like the lambada song sung in Portuguese this time. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of Jason sneaking into the abandoned mm-hmm. club. And again, she's supposed to be doing the sexy dance. What did you think of the dancing in that scene in her address? Well, I, I thought it was I thought it was okay. I was actually surprised. I was like, this I like the way it was lit and shot, the mm. scene and framed. Because like you said, you could you have to do a lot of things in that scene. Mm-hmm. You have to show the relationship and the nature of the dancing. And stuff that's going on between her and Maxwell, but you have to also shoot it in a way that we can see Jason in the background. What we call in in film parlance the deep space, yes. right? So you're using up all of the space of the frame there. From a technical perspective, it's tricky and kind of hard to do. That's one of the hardest scenes to do, and I think they did a decent job. I like the way it was lit. My yeah. complaint about the way that the the dances was shot is maybe that's a limitation of the time, but probably not because there were filmmakers that were doing it better. I wish that the camera was more fluid. Mm. Like I wish that the way the camera moved, moved in a way that captured the camera. The the camera was very rigid. So time it would just cut from, there was a really nice, there was a nice overhead shot of her dancing. Mm. Then it would come back to a normal medium long shot. 
So it was very like normal, traditional editing. Yeah. But I wish the camera was more fluid. Like they had, a, like, because the dance is fluid. The movement is fluid. Yeah. So I don't think you can portray it in that traditional standard editing way. You have to sort of let the camera move with her and, and, and feel that movement of the camera. Again, maybe it was something that if they had a Brazilian or Portuguese DP, you know, um, photographer, maybe they would have come up with a more uh, way of shooting it that was more reflective of the culture. It was shot, it was shot in a very European way that I, I felt didn't do it enough justice. But at the, but that was the best for the movie. I thought that that was the best that they did shooting it. But it still wasn't great. I thought they could have made it made it look a little bit more sensual. But she can't dance, so they had to. True, but even if she could, I don't think they would have shot it better. <laughs> So then we see Maxwell coming up onto the stage and start dancing with her. And he's enthralled. He's taken in by the Lambada, the Forbidden Dance. Oh, how can he not be? And he's so entranced that Jason is able to sneak up on him and punch him out. So they escape together and they go through the windows and walking on the railing and everything is so dangerous. And then we have him like dangling off of the building and then he falls and then they drive away. That's his foot in the process. So at the first club again, so this is where everything is going on with Kid Creole. This is going to be like the live filming. There's a music performance going on. I guess you probably love that. It's automatic. <laughs> it was fun. I liked it. So then we see that Jason is hurt and is told that he cannot dance at the club. So this is like when they're in the back preparing to go on. And we have them coming up on stage and saying we're not going to have them performing anymore because the one of the dancers is hurt and then we get like our next musical number this was a good part like honestly the music was good in this film i'm not going to lie yeah i, I have that look. So yeah. that one was good what did you think of that song i enjoyed both performances but i liked both of them i was vibing with, i was vibing with both of them yeah. And I feel like even like the quality of performance was so much better than the first film. Because again, maybe the two leads were not professional dancers. Yeah. But the performers were professional musicians. musicians yeah. It was a real band. And then out of nowhere, we see Joa and her dad, the chief, the king, showing up to the club. Yeah, and these papers. I'm, I'm just wondering how we crossed the border, but then again, let's let's. How did they? First of all, how did they know that they won the contest? Because if we were to imagine, they knew that uh, Nisa, the day that Nisa and Jason were going to be participating in the contest, because they okay, he probably knew the audition date. How does he know that they actually won? Have enough time for him to go back home, get the dad to get his passport. And uh, the travel that, that, that man ain't got no passport. <laughs> immigration documents. Had no passport. Gets his immigration documents in line. I'm like, okay, he is a chief of their tribe, but is that like recognized? If he had to travel, yeah. If he had to go legit, he wouldn't have problems. He's a chief. But then again, does America even recognize some of these designations? Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, is it recognized? <laughs> like, if he comes to the embassy, they're like, oh, you're the chief of this tribe that has no access to money worldly yeah. possessions and we're yeah. just going to give you immigration papers to go to the usa where people are illegally entering our borders like, from yeah, latin america all the time and yeah. south america well brazil yeah the, him just showing up randomly there was like one of those <laughs> eye rolling moments it was just like perfect timing he comes with the snake and then she's like oh if we're in the jungle he would be able to help you more but since we're here he has a snake where did he get that snake from sorry this makes no sense to me he traveled on the plane with it snakes on the plane so jason is healed in time yay and they dance the lambada together in english it was interesting to me to see the moments where it was sung in portuguese and when it was sung in english because just earlier when she was dancing at the club, the abandoned club, she, it was being sung in Portuguese. So I guess it was like to add to this like sensual, sexual, erotic, exotic kind of thing. But then now that they're dancing on TV, it's being sung in English. And I think that there are a lot of butt cheeks out, which made no sense to me. Makes Jason sense. just said, change your clothes, woman. Well, maybe he had an epiphany. Okay. But you... So what you said about the choice of when the Lambada song was in English or Portuguese, 
that's something I think about a lot or even contemporary shows that are multilingual mm-hmm. because you know, one other thing you have to think about in that moment is that's the moment of victory so in the moment of victory the mm-hmm. victory occurs in the English version of the song mm-hmm. when you watch certain shows where people go back and forth in, in different languages and English is one of the languages on the show and it's an American show at what point do people speak in English most of the time, if it's an American show, is at a at the most important point of the movie. Mm-hmm. So you still end up on a, on a TV show in many cases. Yeah, we're trafficking in multilingualism, but we're still emphasizing a hierarchy because at the apex, at the most critical point, English is the language that dominates there. That's something that I see that happens still now, and, I, and it gets me really frustrated and annoyed because I understand the limitations sometimes in terms of you want to have good actors, but... It's hard sometimes, depending on the project, to have actors who speak all the languages. So I get, I get it. But at the same time, the, the sort of privileging of English in those moments, it makes me uncomfortable. And I personally, I'm not going to comment on how the father was dressed because I am not from the tribe. I do not know if the wardrobe department went and seek out traditional tribal wear of the chiefs from that Amazon tribe. Do I I think, in my personal opinion, that it was not something that they bought at a Halloween costume shop. But who am I to judge? This is not my culture. I am just consuming the content that is being presented to me. Again, like you're saying, how much conscientiousness did they put into costume design? I mean, we know they filmed this movie in like two weeks, so I'm guessing not much. I don't think they got a professor of indigenous Brazilian culture as an advisor so i'm going to guess that it was not necessarily the most accurate representation maybe someone will listen to this whose parents worked on this film and who's oh <laughs> very upset and would send you a sternly worded email so they finish dancing they're interviewed by the lead singer of kid creole who <laughs> This scene was so funny to me. I'm sorry. He's asking Jason, how did you learn how to dance like that? And he says, everything I learned, I learned it from Nisa. And then he goes to Nisa. This is me recalling this from memory. So I might mix up some stuff. But then he turns to Nisa and he says, Nisa, that's a pretty name. Where is that from? And then she says something like, it means princess in my language. And he's like, where are you, where are you from? And then she goes like, um, I'm from the Amazon I'm a princess and my people are being hooded by the Petramco company. The Kid Creole guy, he goes, Petramco is at this same... Till this point, we still don't know what Petramco does. eh? We just know that they're a big company. But what do they do? Nobody knows. They just cut down trees. That's the big bad wolf. They just cut down trees. So he goes, Petramco is at the same company that we see their products in the supermarkets. And Jason goes, yeah, that's the one. And then the lead singer goes... (laughs) I think we're just going to boycott all their products, right? Everybody in the crowd goes wild. And um, yeah, so apparently that's how boycotts work in their little film. Now the problem is solved, Melanie. Yeah, well, peace has finally happened. He just says we're going to boycott them. Everybody cheers in agreement and they're like, okay, let's dance the Lambada. Which is very similar to the first movie. You have this yeah. statements, people talk. Kumbaya, let's dance and everything is okay. Yeah, but at least with Lambada, it was horrible. But uh, we have the little speech from Kevin Laird talking about he had a rough childhood and everybody's, it's still problematic, but like, you know, all of us are one. There are no races, just the human race, you know, like that stereotypical problematic <laughs> uh, yeah. white savior wedding. And then in this film, we just have them literally saying Petramco. Is that the one who sells the products that we buy at the supermarket? Everybody is like, yeah. And then they were like, we're just going to boycott them. Yay. <laughs> but it's not even a real boycott. Do you think they might forget about it after the euphoria of the... Exactly. <laughs> Especially if they have a monopoly over the products that they sell. Who's their competition? It's just a, such a BS simplistic way to quote unquote solve the problem. It's ridiculous. If so we think they just go just announce this on TV and then people are just going to boycott their products and there's not going to be any retaliation from this huge company that was literally 
have the chairman trying to get Maxwell to get rid of her. I know I'm not supposed to be thinking because this movie is not about real analysis, but we couldn't put a little bit more effort into this. They bit up more than they can chew. And one of, one of the smart and, things they did with Lambada is they localize the conflict of the movie. And if you do that, it's easier to get a solution to it. But when your issue is the Amazon rainforest, and <laughs> How do you solve that problem in a movie? Even the end of the movie, right? When the title credits roll, this film yeah. is dedicated to the preservation of the rainforest. Yes. No, the title rolls and we, and we get that, that title credit then. And surprise, surprise, deforestation is still taking place. <laughs> it's still a big Yeah, which is one of the, the, the really interesting things about this movie. And even the and even Lambada, the first one, right? Because you have that sort of class issue still, still happening in LA. But all this to say, the world peace was solved, even if it was for five minutes. I think we're, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of, of, of a project that's bringing this movie back into the public mm-hmm. consciousness. I hope that more people will, li- will watch the movie. And if you want to watch this film legally, like we did, you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> And on that note, which film do you prefer? Lambada. Had more, had more bars, more unintentional comedy. There was some more style, some more di- directorial style there that I liked. And like you said, the acting was slightly better. And it was, it was smarter. And on that note, folks, <laughs> we have yep. come to the end of our analysis of Lambada and the Forbidden Dance. We had our winners and we had our losers. Well, we had one loser. I think it would have been the Forbidden Dance. <laughs> even title-wise, they didn't even get to use the name Lambada. They <laughs> lost everywhere. Thank you so much for listening to us ramble on and on about these two films that deserve absolutely no awards. I'm not sure if they help propel anybody's career in a positive direction. I doubt But thank you for listening to us on this very wacky journey of two films that had no business being created in the first place. (laughs) And if you would like to stay connected with us, um, you can find our contact details in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to us and please enjoy the rest of your day. (laughs) Bye. Bye. (laughs) I did it.